I started my career as a teacher in inner city Coventry. I then went into politics, eventually becoming a minister in the education department. Looking back at my early years as a classroom teacher, I'm not sure I can ever remember research impacting on what I did in the classroom. Building a bridge between research and practice is one of the big challenges facing education at the moment. Here in York, that challenge is being met. There's top quality research here in the Department for Education, but more than that, there's a concern about whether or not it has an impact in the nation's classrooms and whether it influences the decisions that politicians take. Policies can prescribe a course of action for teaching and learning, but there are messy human factors that can disrupt the actual implementation of these policies. We can predict these human factors by using a variety of methodologies. We use self-report surveys to look at motivation factors, eye tracking to look at eye movements to measure engagement during teaching, and we use handheld devices to look at teachers' emotions on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Human infants are born to use eye contact in order to look for who is important to them, but also what is important to them. Um, so they use the eye direction of adults around them in order to learn about the world. Eye contact contains information about the trustworthiness, the hostility, and the nature of the teacher-student relationship. And this in turn allows us to measure the emotional experience of the students in a classroom. A new researcher might ask questions such as, how can we learn a second language? How do genetics influence educational outcomes? And how does early attachment influence classroom behavior? When teaching English or any other foreign language, classroom teachers are in a better position to select the right materials or techniques if they are aware of the principles of acquiring a language. Why don't children feel more motivated to study languages to higher levels? And how can we help them to learn faster? What's involved in the very first few hours of exposure to a language? What role does memory have? And how can we help them to perceive language better? I spent time working as a teacher and a school psychologist, and I often heard teachers and students talking about their level of motivation and engagement and their emotions, their anxiety, their boredom. In the 1970s, there were some government reports and trade union reports that suggested that teaching was a stressful profession. But these were largely based on anecdotal evidence, and that just doesn't give you a reliable and full picture of what's really going on. I devised a questionnaire that had a list of items of possible sources of stress, and I coupled these with a rating scale and then distributed the questionnaire to teachers throughout England. Since then, it can be compared with other data collected in different ways, such as through interviews and case studies to build up a rigorous evidence-based picture of what's going on, which can then shape policy and the way teachers and schools can combat teacher stress. Over the last 20 years, there's been a sea change in the way governments make use of research evidence. So now is an exciting time for you to be doing your study that can have an influence. There's not a straight line from research to influencing policy. It's much more a matter, I think, of influencing key people in agencies that have influence on practice and on policy, and accepting that those people may change and the interests of those organisations may shift over time. So I think you've got to accept that influencing policy can be a bumpy ride and you've got to be in it for the long term rather than expecting quick fire solutions. When I was a school teacher in Wimbledon, I was genuinely shocked about how few young people went on to study science beyond the compulsory period. This started me thinking, what could I do about such a situation? And this led me to develop two context-based physics units for use with 14-year-olds to see if it engaged them more in the science they were studying. Finding that this worked encouraged me to go on to pursue a career in science education research. Research evidence lets us target very specific educational aims when we design activities for use in classrooms. For example, when teaching about forces, setting this in the context of bone fractures makes the topic much more attractive to pupils who've shown an interest in pursuing medical careers. 
Our GCSE course, 21st Century Science, is now taken by one in five students in schools in England. It's often more effective to involve teachers in collecting research data for themselves. Collecting data in their own classes gives it an immediacy, makes them feel that what they're finding does relate to the situation in which they work, and they're much more likely then to reflect on what they do, to think about how it might need to be improved and to make changes. IRIS is an international York-led project which makes available data collection materials for teachers and students and researchers to download. The materials contain questionnaires, language tests, observation schedules, so that teachers can use them in the knowledge that these have been tried and tested methods and published. PGCE trainees at the University of York acquire 60 M-level credits. They can then choose to apply those to master's level study at any point throughout their career. Completing your master's study doesn't interfere with your teaching career. We offer a part-time course, which would mean that you can use your day-to-day -day classroom experiences to inform and support your dissertation work. There is the possibility that the educational potential of young people for them to understand society and for them to develop the skills to take part in it is not being fully realised. We put pressure on other researchers, policy makers and professionals to help young people develop the skills to take part in contemporary society. If we can get the relationship between research and practice right, it will be nothing short of a revolution. If teachers can make decisions and policy makers make policies, based on good quality evidence, at the end of the day, the quality of teaching will improve and the real winners will be the children in the classrooms and all of us as citizens of this country. <laughs>